thank you all for being here. I think that for four sessions devoted to a Yiddish poem, we have uh, attracted and maintained quite a crowd, not just numerically, is this uh, a large gathering for Yiddishists, but also in terms of your consistent engagement and uh, uh, participation in these sessions has really been very gratifying to me, very inspiring. And I wanna thank everybody who's participated in each and in all of the sessions. Uh, thank you again to Simon for the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite works of Yiddish literature and one of the most uh, distinctive and original poems uh, uh, in 20th century Yiddish modernism. Uh, there's a lot more to say. There's a lot more to do while we are uh, uh, gathered together today. I wanna just make a couple of comments uh, in terms of uh, the larger scheme of things. First of all, this is not my tie. I borrowed this tie from my dad and I believe very strongly in giving credit where credit is due. Um, I might have been able to give this lecture uh, uh, otherwise, but I would not have been as well dressed as I am without my father's uh, 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 participation. I still need to be dressed by people. So thank you for that. Um, also last time uh, we ended the session two minutes early. So Simon said, I can only get paid if we add two minutes to today's uh, uh, broadcast. He was very clear about that. It's in the contract. So uh, please let's um, talk about, you know, the poem uh, uh, sufficient for me to uh, agree, make the terms of the lecture series. Um, I welcome your comments. I welcome your questions. If you have uh, uh, an urgent question, uh, please pose it while we're talking, just, you know, uh, join in and um, uh, uh, write it in the chat. Uh, let me ask, though, that while we're in the lecture portion, before we open it up to general comments, please do not send me a private comment. And the reason why I ask this is because I missed some private comments that were sent to me during the lecture um, last time, and I don't want to miss anything. So either please uh, pose a question to the whole audience so that everybody can see it, or wait until we're in the discussion period, which will happen uh, in about uh, uh, an hour or so. Now, let's begin properly. Uh, uh, some more people have joined us, and that's always good news, including some very welcome friends of mine. So hi, everybody. Um, we began our sessions, what was it, three weeks ago? This is the fourth session. So three weeks ago, we began talking about the role of Belarus, of uh, Reisen in the development of modern Yiddish culture. We talked about some of the distinctive aspects of uh, Belarusian and what we would call more generally Litvish culture. Litvish understood as a Yiddish designation that does not correspond directly to the geographical formations or even the linguistic formations that we understand among Northern Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, Latvia, and so on. But nonetheless, um, we talked also about Kolbach's biography and how he is both the culmination of some very um, exciting uh, uh, literary developments over the course of the late 19th and early 20th century and why he's such an exceptional figure worthy of our attention, worthy of our close reading, particularly in his uh, poetry. And then we began to read the poem. Uh, in our second session, we talked a little bit about the formal contours of the poem, the notion that this poem is uh, what we have been referring to as an Byronic or as a Byronic ballad and what significance the Byronic ballad has in 19th century literature, broadly understood in the American context and the British context, Lord Byron himself, obviously a British poet, uh, in uh, uh, the European context generally, and how it is that Kulbach comes to adapt the Byronic model, not just in this poem, but in some of his later long poems as well. Last time, 
we talked about the structure of the poem and how the middle section of the poem, which we focused on last time, uh, really reflects a division in the poem that has not just, uh, uh, let's say, an architectural logic, but also a profound thematic significance to the way the poem develops dramatically. So with that very, very brief uh, review and the reminder as has been posted uh, uh, in our chat box that the previous discussions are available online through YouTube and at the Eshkolot website, we're now going to conclude with the final quarter of this 12 part uh, miniature mock epic Byronic ballad, Reisen. And just to reiterate a comment that I made in a previous session, the name Reisen, the old Yiddish name for Belarus, it was not a familiar name in Yiddish. Kolbach is being consciously archaic in his use of the, of the place name Reisen. This is going to be especially significant in today's session. But also, he's reminding us of the homonym Reisen, Belarus, but also reisen, to tear, to rip, to draw asunder. This is also a resonance. So that at the same time as Kulbach paints a picture for us of this strangely idyllic rural meditation about Jewish peasants, he's also emphasizing for us in the name of the poem itself, that something has occurred that ruptures our connection to this family, this people, this way of life. And today, ultimately, we're going to be talking about what Kolbach has in mind for this poem. It becomes uh, more grandly clear to us as we read the final sections and uh, why in thematic, dramatic, and historical terms, the world that he is evoking for us is meant to be understood as a world that we no longer have uh, direct contact with. We'll meditate on this further as a group uh, in a little while. But for the first, I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. We're going to go through each poem. We're gonna start in the Yiddish. We're gonna go over to the translation. I know that the translation is an English translation, which is not necessarily more familiar for some of you than, uh, uh, than the original is, but please bear with me and I appreciate your engagement. So here we go with the Yiddish version. I hope everybody can see the screen. I'm trusting that everybody can see the screen. If you cannot, please interrupt me and say we can't see the screen. But we'll start with the 10th section of the uh, poem. Uh, uh, Hannah Ganshwar uh, reminds us that this was actually sung uh, as a Yiddish song in her childhood. So um, uh, Hannah, uh, maybe during the discussion, you can favor us with a uh, recitation of the melody. I'm gonna try my version now. I hope it works okay. Der Vetter Itze. Sotzach Vetter Itze, ois gelernt Schneiderei, macht der alte Sermienkes, punkt wie Spogel nei. Macht der alte Sermienkes, Punkt, wie Spogel nei. Kommt er in a Derfel an mit der Nodelfaden, hängt er eus a Wewiske, do verrichtmen begodem. Hängt er eus die Wewiske, do verrichtmen begodem. Sitzt der Vetter auf dem Tisch, terkisch tame Warte, trennt und nitze wird und legt, a Latte auf a Latte, trennt und nitze wird und legt. A lata af a lata. Ois gelate wird ein Dorf, geht er in a zweiten, bis er los der Reus von Hand, dem Gegend a Baneten, bis er los der Reus von Hand, dem Gegend a Baneten. <coughs> Sot sich Vetter itze ois gelernt Schneiderei, macht der alte Sermienkes, punkt wie Spogel nei. Macht der alte Sermienkes, punkt. And now I'm going to stop the screen share.
And I'm going to resume the screen share with the English version. Here we go. Uncle Itze, or in this version, not uh, uh, incorrectly, Uncle Itzy. Uncle Itzy. My Uncle Itzy had mastered needlecraft through and through, and he made old ragged clothes, cloaks as good as new. And he made old ragged cloaks as good as new. He'd arrive in a village with his needle and thread, and he hung out his shingles, garments repaired here, it read. And he hung out his shingle, garments repaired here, it read. Uncle Itzy sat at the table with a vacant look, look legs crisscrossed, ripping, reversing, affixing, patching, patch upon cloth, ripping, reversing, affixing, patch upon cloth. Having fully patched one village onto the next, he flitted until he let out from his hands a region fully befitted, until he let out from his hands a region fully befitted. My uncle Itzy mastered needlecraft through and through, and he made old ragged cloaks as good as new, and he made old ragged cloaks as good as new. Now, there's a lot happening in this brief poem, which seems so simple. But the first thing that we should note is how different the setting and the uh, uh, cultural uh, uh, portrait this is from the rest of the poem. The rest of the poem has been de dealing with peasants, people who are close to the land, people who work the land, people who harvest lumber, people who work the fields, people who drive the barges. But uh, here we're dealing with a tailor, right? So says, uh, so says uh, Anton, he reminds us that, that uh, 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 tailoring, this is a very, very conventional Jewish profession in Eastern Europe. This is not the profession of a village necessarily. This is the profession of a Jewish shtetl. We expect Jews in Eastern Europe to work as tailors. The strong likelihood is uh, my own ancestors living not far from where Kohlbach grew up, probably worked as tailors. Um, that's why uh, my dad picked out this nice tie for me. Um, Uncle Itza is an outlier in this family. There are 18 uh, brothers in this family. There's the, the speaker, the poet's father, and his 17 brothers. They all supposedly work the land, but not Uncle Itza. He works as a tailor. And yet, note what an important job the tailor is in this poem. The tailor is the one who goes from village to village repairing clothes. He is in his circuitous route around the villages. The guy that ties everything together. The guy who makes the old clothes look like new. So um, Yiddishkeit Los Angeles reminds us, was it this poem that you sang, Chana? There's another Fetter Etze that's also based on a poem by Kolbach. We'll have to resolve this in the discussion in a little while, in about an hour. But for the time being, note what uh, Kulbach is saying about the tailor. Now, what he's saying is completely conventional, right? Tailors back in Eastern Europe, back in the era that Kulbach is describing for us, typically worked as patch tailors, people that are called in um, Yiddish uh, um, a tandetnik, you know, somebody who takes old cloth and repurposes it to make something new. Um, what is Kohlbach himself doing in this poem, though? He's taking old material, folkloric material, some of it, you know, so old, so uh, hallowed as to be verging on the cliched, and he turns it into something completely new. He reconfigures the old, seemingly familiar Yiddish past and makes it into a new garment. And it's a garment that stitches together the shtetl with the village, the peasants with the artisans. Now, 
we might say, well, this sounds precariously close to the Soviet ideal that the farmers and the workers were going to come together and create a, 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 a new way of life, a new human being, a new society. There's an element of that, but keep in mind, Kohlbach is actually writing this in Berlin in 1922, long before he had committed to living in the Soviet Union. And there's an element of this, there's an aspect of this, there is a um, connotation of this that's not just specifically Soviet, or what we could say in 1922 is perhaps Bolshevik, but actually it was a general ideal that uh, 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 informed the radicalism of a spectrum of ideologies. The Soviets wanted to bring the workers and the um, farmers together. The Zionists actually wanted to do the same thing. They wanted uh, to remake Jews into a productive workforce, a productive society of artisans and farmers. The Bundists certainly wanted to do the same in their own ideological uh, territories. And there's an element ideologically, we talked about in previous sessions, an idea of doakite, the idea of presentness is the ideology that animates Yiddish culture in the interwar era. era. There is the idea of land kentenish, uh, appreciating and uh, knowing the landscape, which is an idea that is dear to socialists, assimilationists, and uh, Zionists in Poland in the interwar era. Kulbach, in effect, is speaking to all of them. And yet, at the same time, he is making common cause with none of them from his position in Berlin. And this is a theme that I write about somewhat at length in a book that might just be forthcoming in a few uh, days or weeks. But the idea that for the Yiddish writer working in Berlin, there was this perception, oh, you, you, you've, you've gone to Berlin, you want to escape the problems of Eastern Europe. You're, are you turning your back on us brothers was an accusation that the Yiddish writers living in Berlin faced. There is a great longing. There is a great, uh, not just nostalgia, but a great pathos to the idea. You think that I am, you think that I am immersing myself in this completely modern uh, metropolis, so cut off from the way of life that I knew in Eastern Europe. It's true. But here in Berlin, what I want most of all is um, to get back to Eastern Europe. This is what the Yiddish writers, by and large, were saying in Berlin. Uh, uh, the Hebrew writers felt a very different thing. Many of the Russian writers, not all of them, saw Berlin also as a way station further to the West to leave behind what uh, 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 the old Russia had become as the Soviet Union. But the Yiddish writers wanted to come back. And the pathos that animates this poem is the recognition that even if they come back there, you know, to, to, to put this in colloquial terms, you can come back, but you can't come back all the way. You can return, but where you're returning to is not going to be the place that you left. And in that sense, this ballad is an elegy to the old, uh, uh, to the, to the old uh, Eastern Europe. Let's hold these thoughts. Let's go back to the poem. I'm going to share the screen again. Winter by Nacht in der Altitschke Chate. Uh, at night in the winter in the old, old cottage. Is man gelegen by Nacht in der Altitschke Chate. Geräuche die Lilkes, die Gräuße, gebrummt und gesoppet. Farmatete haben die Vetters gekocht, Tame Watte. In Schweiz ist ein Vetter gesessen beim Tisch und gechrappet. In Stiebel hat Keim a Lucina a Stille gebrennt. Dabei hat der Vetter Rachmil die Häusen verschabet. A Schnee hat gechlappet in Fenster, a Wind hat geklappt in die Wand. Die Sasslina hat sich in Oven und Wendel geschrobet. 
Es hat sich der Seide gedreht auf dem Oven dem Hessen. Und keiches das Hemd aufgeöffnet, in Ansten beschlagen. Der Wind auf dem Feld hat die Qualies in niemand gestoßen. Die alte Beheme in Stahl hat nicht aufgehört klagen. Es sind die Vetters gelegen zu zwei in die Betten, tempt mit die Zürre zum Balken geguckt und geschwiegen. Der Seidenu hat sich gekehrt. Oh, der Seidenu hat sich gebetten. Avromchek, mein Kind, tu sung uns a treurige Nicken. Von heißen Gelege herab is Avram der Vetter. In Heuschiknisch is er gewen wie a Jodle a Groa. O hat er gegeben a Song wie a Wind in Ossiendike Blätter, hat er gegeben a Tunkele Chate a Voye. A Zoi wie es Voye ta Wolf bei der Nacht ab die Wegen, a Zoi wie es Voye ta Wolf a Faschnete Leuchtener Plänen. Verteilte seine die Vetters wie Kletzer gelegen. Es hat plötzlich der Seidene still angehäuben zu wehnen. Er hat sich gedreht auf den Oven, geklappt in die Ziegel. O oh Gott, in you, help us, help, es ist finster und bitter. Dem Vetter auf Rom ist, ist durch in die Beinere Zitter. Es hat sich der Niggen gegeben ein Goss wie ein Spiegel, gegeben ein Klung wie ein Wasser in Nepplen in Blue. In Heuschicknisch ist er gewähnt wie ein Dem a Gesunder. Hat er ein Tresel getan, die zu prine, a Ruf und a Runter. Das hat er der Sein in dem Cholum Nastasien. Er hat sich a weggestellt, Eis und gegeben a Ritsche. Also wie ein Auger, was bängt noch a Klatsche a Heise. A Sprung und a Heib sich getan mit die Hand in die Bockes. Als haben von Freud sich zerpintelt bei jedem die Augen. Und seinen die schlechte Gedanken er soi wie Sarakis, wie Grohe von Tunkeler Chate zerfleugen. Ist er a Reus in a Tänzel, a Sung und a Setz mit die Stiebel. A Brenn in der Luft wie a Flamm mit die heiße Schwarzapfeln. Als hat sich der Seide der Field, wie er flieht mit dem Stiebel. Er kriegt ergets heuch, ergets heuch ab zerbrochene Stapeln. Zu tummelt von Niggen, gelähmt is der Vetter geblieben. In Skoverod hat schon gekleert die letzte Lucine. Der Seidenu hat sich zerschmeichelt, die Hände sich gerieben. Avremele wusste genommen, er sah kaum Negine. Der Blue von Fartog ist er rein in der warmen Chate, verwickelt in Streu, hat Beimer in Gorten ge gefroren. Der Wind hat in Vierhäus gezuppt von a Pelzel die Watte. Die alte Beheme in Stahl ist anschwiegen geworden. Okay. So I want to point out a couple of linguistic remarks that are rather significant, I hope. First, you'll note that uh, uh, the uncles, those of you who are uh, uh, reading along in Yiddish, the uncles are all sitting tamavata. They're sitting simply, plainly, without any kind of um, affect, without any kind of affectation. This is how the uncle Itza sat in the previous poem when he was uh, 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 rending and repairing garments. So there's a, there's a thematic link in the choice of language that uh, Kohlbach is using between the two poems. We haven't seen a great deal of that, so when it occurs, we can remark the significance on it. There's a couple of words that I find very interesting in this. For the most part, 
Kulbach is not drawing on the terms of Jewish ritual in this poem. We've noted two instances previously where there's a direct reference to uh, Jewish ritual. When the uncles take to working in the fields, they go via mizmer. They, they go as if they were reciting a psalm, that the work they do early in the morning takes the place of early in the morning davening, even though the size of the family is large enough that they could constitute their own synagogue minion if they wanted to. That's significant. Um, uh, the other uh, uh, moment in the poem where there's a reference to Jewish tradition, to Jewish ritual, uh, it is referring to the grandmother as a bar minen, as, a, uh, as a, uh, uh, one of the sanctified dead, someone over whom it is uh, obligatory to, um, to handle the body as a kosher Jewish uh, uh, soul, uh, uh, to be buried properly with Jewish rites. Um, that's another conspicuous intrusion of uh, 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 Jewish ritual. We're going to get one more in the poem, no spoiler alerts, but now I just want to point out two rather unusual uh, Hebrew-derived words. They don't necessarily refer to um, ritual as such, but they have their own significance by the conspicuousness of their origin. One is uh, uh, referring to the darkness here as Hoshechnish, the darkness that was known in Egypt. It is used as an adjective here, but in general, Hoshech is a very unusual word to describe darkness in Yiddish. And it's something that I have not really encountered very much before 20th century Yiddish literature where I've encountered it quite a great deal. And the way that I would, understand, I would explain this I don't necessarily think that what uh, Kohlbach is saying is that uh, night in the winter time in the old cottage is like the darkness of Egypt, the darkness of the ninth plague, but that the use of this word hoishach indicates that the Yiddish language as such is exploring new, what we could call dialectical um, uh, uh, avenues of expression, that the Hebrew gets more Hebraic than it was in the 19th century, that the Slavic gets more localized and regionalized than it had been in the 19th century, and that uh, words from other languages are used, if you'll uh, forgive the expression, more promiscuously that the uh, intensity of the Hebrew component is used to offset the importation of a lot more new words into the Yiddish uh, uh, language. And finally, here in this poem, when the uh, grandfather exclaims how good Uncle Avram sings, he says, what a kol nagina you have, what a voice for melody you have. Kol nagina, again, this is a word from Hebrew, from the Hebraic or Lushan Kodesh component of the Yiddish language. It is an unusual word. So all this by way of the Yiddish, we're going to turn to the translation now. Before we do, I'm going to stop the share and look at the... Um, uh, uh, so Anastasia is looking forward to my book. Anastasia, I am too, hopefully en route. Uh, uh, so here uh, we're all very, very uh, 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 interested in hearing Hannah uh, sing the uh, uh, poem Def Hatter Itze. So this is uh, uh, something to look forward to later on. For now, let's look at the translation of the section that I just read for you, please. And here we go. Winter at night in the old hut. My stupefied uncles lay in the old hut and stared with exhaustion at night where they lay. Smoking big pipes, they murmured and panted. One sat at a table snoring and sweating. A last bit of torch on the wall was still burning. By its light, Uncle Rachmil stitched up his trousers. Wind pounded the hut and snow lashed the window. The oven door scraped at the wall, and my grandpa twisted and turned on the oven. He was weak and enveloped in fear, his nightshirt unbuttoned. The wind on the meadow stirred up the waves of the Neman. 
The old cow in the barn kept up her incessant complaining. The uncles by twos lay in their beds. They turned their dull faces and gazed at the rafters in silence. My grandfather, twisting and turning, begged his son, Avram, my child, won't you give us a sad song? Then Avram crawled from his warm bed. There in the dark, he was gray as a fir tree and sang like the wind stirring the leaves in the autumn. Then howled in the dark as a wolf does, at night on the roads as a wolf might, howl in a snow-dazzled plain like logs my uncles lay huddled. As my grandfather beat at the oven and wept, oh Lord, help us, life is dark, life is bitter. Through Avram's strong frame passed a shudder, and his song gave a spurt like a mirror, like a lake in blue fog, it resounded. And he was as dark as an oak and as sturdy. He threw his hair back and put himself in position like a stallion that yearns for a hot mare. For in a dream, he had, sing, he had seen the young Gentile Nastasia. Then he danced with his hands on his hips and he kindled a gleam of delight in the eyes of the watchers till the griefs in the hut fled like gray magpies. Avram danced and he sang and he stamped with his great boots. His eyes glowed, the air scorched. He was a flame, he was fire, till my grandfather felt that he and the hut were both flying, that he was creeping up high on a broken rung ladder. My uncle stood still, confused by his singing. The last bit of torch flickered out in its socket. Grandpa smiled, rubbed his hands and said, Avram, where do you get such a voice? The blue dawn light crept into the hut. The trees in the garden wound round with straw were still freezing. The wind in the cart shed plucked wool from a sheepskin. The old cow in the barn lapsed at last into silence. So there's a lot going on here. Let's talk a little bit about what we see, what we read, what we hear, what we feel. Winter at night in the old hut. Everybody, this is, this is, the, this is a never ending night. And yet what we realize by the time we get to the poem, it is uh, the darkness just before the dawn. Let me take a look at the uh, uh, chat just a second. Hannah notes that the sound of the poem, especially in the original, is just is just so musical. And this is one of the um, one of the great gifts that Kulbach has as a poet, that his words are like music. This is what we want of all poetry generally, but Kulbach has an exceptional gift for, uh, in particular, the assonance of the Yiddish language. It's, uh, its ability to build on uh, vowel sounds, not just in rhyme, but to create a music out of the Yiddish language. There is a silence and a stupefaction in the scene. Uncle Rachmiel is knitting a garment. The grandpa is trying to sleep. People are too tired for words after a long day uh, 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 in the fields. And to break this um, desolation, to cut the sounds of the wind screaming across the waters, the cows shivering in their stalls. The grandfather says to Avram, won't you sing us a sad song? Now we might think in biblical terms of Saul asking King David to sing a psalm to him. But we noticed in particular, Avram has been a really, really important figure in this poem. He's the most significant dramatic figure, perhaps other than the grandfather himself. And although it's not expressed explicitly, this poem gives voice to the tensions that are uh, uh, undercutting and uh, overriding the poem as a whole. 
we don't quite know what song Avram is singing, although I'm going to make a suggestion in a second but we know that his voice is very beautiful and it speaks to the longings of the night. The grandfather weeps in response to the beauty of Avram's song. And he says, oh Lord, help us. Life is dark, life is bitter. And Avram shudders at this moment. Now we know Avram is the uncle who is pursuing a romantic relationship with Nastasia, the non-Jewish woman. Here, her status as a young Gentile is evoked explicitly in our poem, which might be a sanitized version made acceptable for a Soviet readership. Uh, it's only referring to Nastasia by name. And that's, that's sufficient to indicate that we're dealing with a non-Jewish peasant woman. But where the grandfather sees darkness and bitterness, Avram sees Nastasia. And we can comment on the possibility that whether consciously the grandfather knows what he's saying or unconsciously the seed is planted in Avram's heart while he is singing, the source of the grandfather's bitterness is the subject of Avram's longing, Nastasia herself. Let's see what's happening in the chat. Yes, yeah, so uh, Digoya is in the original version. In the Soviet edition that we're consulting, uh, they take that uh, uh, politically incorrect term out. I don't know if it hurts the poem that this word is missing. Um, but we know already that we're dealing with a non-Jewish woman uh, 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 when uh, Avram evokes Nastasia. A gleam of delight in the eyes of the watchers till the griefs in the hut fled like gray magpipes. This is the power of Avram's song. This is the power that the poem either replicates for us or calls attention to its unavailability to us. We might think sitting in Yiddish Belarus that our uh, connection to the land is fulfilled in the poet's song. We might think writing this poem in Berlin or publishing this poem in New York that our longing is intensified by noting the uh, unavailability of the world around us, by the disconnection of the imagery of the poem from our day-to-day -day life in a different dispensation entirely. So uh, 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 for uh, Anton in our chat, this is, uh, as, it, as it were, the kind of um, late night uh, discussion of three old wise men uh, uh, together at night. Um, there are you know, three or four characters that are invoked here, but the subject matter of this song is certainly not the old words of Torah that we might have imagined in the house of study in a shtetl. It is a Slavic song uh, uh, addressed uh, to Nastasia, a Slavic love interest. The song is encoding the dissipation of this old world. At the moment, when it is in dialogue with that world. My uncle stood still, confused by his singing. The last bit of torch flickered out of it, out of, in its socket. The grandpa smiled. Avram, where do you get such a voice? And the dawn light begins to shine through the uh, 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 window. Heaven only knows how early in the morning this is when they're singing, but soon enough, it's gonna be time to get off the oven, get out of bed, get dressed and go back to the fields. We can ask ourselves, does the grandpa know what he's saying? Is he adding to, to Avram's uh, distress? 
consciously or unconsciously. But the old cow in the barn lapses into silence with the, appearing, uh, the appearance of the dawn. Uh, it is the beginning of a new day. We don't yet know what that day will bring. But what's about to happen in the poem is one of uh, uh, the most important sections uh, of the poem as a, as a whole. Let me see what I can do by way of um, an after the fact effort at poor justice to Coolbach's magnificent words. I'm gonna share the screen again. Antosha spielt auf der Bandura. Now this poem, I'm going to depart from my usual practice. I usually speak uh, a standard Yiddish, which is an academic Yiddish. It's a Yiddish that was developed primarily, not exclusively, but in large part uh, in Vilna in the 1920s. It's the standard that all of us try to teach when we teach Yiddish. But for this poem, I think it's necessary to try to imitate however poorly, an actual Lithuanian uh, Yiddish dialect. Uh, bear with me, please. Antosha spielt auf der Bandura. Hey, 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 Antosha, to a zung, to a klung, auf der Bandura, schure, bure, mure, ture, auf der Zee, hey, hey. Zu gewähn der Krever Dukas, weiß wie Schnee, weiß wie Schnee. Hot er kinderlich im Palaz Techter zwei, Techter zwei. Nor beim Dukes bei die Pferd hat gedient Dimitrik Skarulia mit Nomen Schalapai. Hey, 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 Antosche, tu a Zung, tu a Klung auf der Bandura, Schura, Bura, Mura, Tura. Otter Zay, hey, hey, sis gekommen, wesne Zeit. Brennt der Boim die Nähe zweigelich, brennt die Schwalb das Schwelbele, brennt die Zeig erheim die Zeigelich und die Kuh das Kelbele. Es ist gekommen westne Zeit, paar die Techterlich die Zwei, bringen sie erheim zum Dukes in dem Fartig, zu Beistrukes, weh, weh, weh. Hey, 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 Antosha, to a zong, to a klong, after Bandora, Shurabura, Muratura, Otaze, hey, hey. Chap der Dukas sich zum Schwer, heis der Dukas spannen fair, und von Krebe bis Magier, und von Jettel bis Damir, Jogen Reiter und Karetten, Leifen, Leifen Lafer, Lafer, und Stapetten, Sis in Ergetz nit gewein, Nitzusein dem Ritzeach Schalapai. Hey, 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 Antosha, tu a Zung, tu a Klung auf der Bandura, Schura, Bura, Mura, Tura, Ota Zay. Hey, hey, in die Wälder von Kribitsch, weint der Gaslin Schalapai, und der alte Krever Dukes, weiß wie Schnee, weiß wie Schnee, fort allein über die Pläinen, in dem ritterlichen Pracht, on er klingt mit die Kleisein in der Nacht, in der Nacht. Hey, 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 Antosha, tu a Zung, tu a Klung auf der Bandura, Schura, Bura, Mura, Tura, Ote Zay. Hey, hey. This is also a musical song. In, indeed, this is a musical song. This is a song that's meant to be sung. And I'm going to go a little bit uh, uh, further in my uh, discussion of its significance after we read the translation. But I want to remark, as, as Fagel is and uh, as all of us are when we hear this, this is clearly meant to be a kind of a folk song. And we, we uh, understand this through the repetition, through the regularity, through the compression of the uh, uh, lines. Simon has given us a musical setting of this, which maybe we can listen to in the discussion as a group. What I want to say out the bat, because there's a lot to be said about this. Again, this is one of the most important sections of the entire poem in terms of explaining the logic and the motivation of the poem. But note, if you will, how far we have gone. 
from the world of literary, uh, 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 of literary lyric poetry here. We are replicating the world of folk song in what is otherwise in certain respects a very modern and even a modernist poem. And one of the uh, uh, one of the distinctions between folk song and lyric poetry is the extent to which folk song doesn't just aspire to the musical quality of language, it depends on that quality to the point where the refrain of the poem actually has words that make no sense. They're nonsense words. They're only there to keep time, to fill in the musical spaces that the poem depends on in order to be a folk song. So at the same time that Kulbach is knitting together the world of lyric poetry, the world of the Byronic ballad with the world of folk song. He is demonstrating for us how precarious this is for the use of language as literature and as the communication of information. There is in a musical sense very little that distinguishes the very significant thematic place names that are referenced in this poem from the Shura, Bura, Mura, Tura that have no linguistic significance except as sounds that replicate the rhythm and the rhyme of the folk song itself. Let's take a look now at the English translation. Antosha plays his bandura. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, Antosha, raise your voice. Make some noise on the bandura. Shura, bura, mura, tura. Just that way. Hey, hey. Once there lived the Duke of Crivia, as white as snow, as white as snow. He had children in his palace, daughters too, daughters too. But at the Duke's in his stable served young Dimitrix Skarulia, who was known as the Rapscallion. Hey, 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 Antosha, raise your voice, make some noise. On the bandura, shura, bura, mura, tura. Just that way. Hey, hey, hey. And the springtime came a springing on the trees, new branches bringing. The swallow nestled with her fledgling. The goat took home her kitty offspring and the cow, her little calf. And the springtime came a springing for the daughters, for those two. To the duke they came home bringing in their aprons, their misbegotten. Alas, alas, alack a day. So the duke took his sword and the duke bad horses harnessed from the creve to Majir, from Jitalava to Damir. The knights and chariots gave chase and the footmen and couriers ran and nowhere was there to be seen that dread bandit, the rapscallion. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, Antosha, raise your voice, make some noise on your bandura, shora, bura, mora, tura, just that way. Hey, hey. In the forest of Krivici dwells the brigand, the rapscallion, and the aged Duke of Trivia, as white as snow, as white as snow, rides alone upon the plains in his knightly coat of armor, and his weapon goes on rattling through the night, through the night. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, Antosha, raise your voice. Make some noise on your bandura, shura, bura, mura, tura, just that way. Hey, hey. I want to suggest, even though this is credited to Antosha, which is the same name as uh, Nastasia's peasant father, that this or a version of this is the song that Avram himself is singing in the Chata. Antosha plays his Mandora a folk song. Once there lived the Duke of Krivia, he had children in his palace, daughters too. But at the Duke's in his stable served young Dimitrix Skarulia, who is known as the Rapscallion. I want to suggest that essentially what the Rapscallion Skarulia has done has been nothing less than to violate the daughters of the Duke. And this is what causes the epic battle joined in this folk song, uh, uh, evoked in this uh, uh, folk song. The Duke took to his sword and the Duke bad horses harness from Kreva to Majir, from Jatalava to Damir. Well, 
These are place names that have relatively little significance to Jews in Eastern Europe, but they have a whole lot of significance to uh, uh, Eastern European history more broadly understood and specifically to Belarusian history. These are the place names that their villages in the 19th and 20th century, they are of quintessential, they're of foundational historical importance to uh, Belarus. And I've learned all this both from reading the scholarship and from participating in reading groups of this poem with my friend and colleague Mikhail Krutikov at the University of Michigan. He's written about the uh, resonances of this section of the poem to Belarusian history. And essentially, these villages are the place names that evoke not just the origins of a Belarusian ethnic identity, but the grand alliance that was created in the Middle Ages among Belarus, Lithuania, and Poland. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was created in these villages. It would be like setting a poem in the United States in, in Lexington and Concord. You know, these are the foundational sites of Belarusian nationhood. In the forests of Krevici dwells the brigand the Rapscalia, and the aged Duke of Krivia, as white as snow, rides alone upon the plains in his knightly coat of armor, and his weapon goes on rattling through the night, through the night. It's as if the ghost of the Duke of Krivia continues to haunt the landscape that Kulbach is uh, evoking. And what's so remarkable about this and what is fundamental to the poem is it is in this uh, section, it is in this chapter of our ballad that Kulbach most explicitly sings the song of the Belarusian people. This is the moment where the tale of a um, tribe, the tale of a large family of Jewish peasants, becomes the song of Belarus itself, sung paradoxically in Yiddish. As I meant to suggest earlier, this is the song that Avram has learned from Antosha, and he brings it to the Chata. He brings it to the hut where he and his family resides. It becomes a song simultaneously of the Belarusian people and the Jewish people. It becomes an epic of the old Polish-Lithuanian commonwealth, the conjoining of which was the foundational moment not only for any subsequent epic of Eastern European greatness as distinguished from Russian imperialism or German nationalism, all the ethnicities in between those larger geopolitical powers of the uh, modern world. It is also the moment in which Jews came to Eastern Europe. It was under the auspices of a Polish-Lithuanian commonwealth in the Middle Ages that Jews came to Eastern Europe and that Yiddish became an Eastern European Jewish language. So Kulbach is simultaneously singing a song of Belarusian nationhood in Yiddish and identifying the origins of that nationhood in the origins of a Lithuanian Yiddish Jewish consciousness. And that's one of the reasons, I think, why this song must be sung in a Lithuanian Yiddish accent, as poorly as I have replicated it for you here because the regional specificity here signifies simultaneously for Jews and non-Jews as a fusion of the two nations. Now we've got some comments that I think that I anticipate are going to be very important, so let me uh, uh, read them. Um, so Anton is reminding us that folk songs and lyric poetry are very different. 
Um, but uh, um, there's a whole literature uh, devoted to this, indeed. Uh, Zisha's version is based on another version. There are dozens of publications of the poem with a lot of little differences. I love this poem too. Um, the Zisel sing it, um, and Anton says it's the, it's the same song. It's the same song with a different chorus, right? It's the same song in a different intonation. It's the same song in a different language. It is a song that is meant to evoke multiple nations simultaneously. And that simultaneity is the vantage point from which Kohlbach sings this song. He is declaring, I am Belarusian. I am a product of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. I am Jewish. I am a Yiddish poet. And at the same time as I am all of these things, I'm also, lamentably, none of them. Because I'm a guy looking for work, trying to support himself, trying to express himself in Berlin, which is the closest metropolis to these regions, but it is also their repudiation. It is their antithesis. This is Kohlbach lamenting his own exile from this notion of a homeland a homeland that is in the process of being remade as a completely different space under the auspices of the Soviet Union. And Simon notes, interesting that Christianity is what has been taken out of this Polish, Lithuanian, Belarusian foundation myth. Indeed, but this, Simon, you're, you're raising the most important point here. This is significant to the uh, construction of a Belarusian national identity as distinct from Polish nationalism, Lithuanian nationalism, and Russian nationalism. Russian nationalism is inextric inextricable from the Parasławne Eastern Orthodox Church. You can't have Russian nationhood, nationalism, without loyalty to the Russian Orthodox Church. This was fundamental to what defined Russian nationalism. You can't have Polish nationalism uh, without dedication to the Catholic Church. In the imperial formation, uh, specifically in the Austrian Empire, there was a very ingenious solution to this problem of church and state. There was the creation under Austrian auspices of a Greek unionate Catholicism. It was a Catholicism that followed the rituals of the Eastern Orthodox Church but uh, pledged loyalty to the Austrian Kaiser. It was a specifically uh, 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 Austrian variant of a larger theological and political problem that resulted in the creation of what was known in Austrian terminology as a Ruthenian ethnic identity, as distinct from a Ukrainian one, which implied allegiance to Russia. But Belarusian national, national identity is something different. It is not tied to the construction of a specific theology or a specific church. And therefore, what Kohlbach is drawing attention to is the possibility that Belarus in particular holds the offering of a national identity in which Jews can also be included. Now, there's a lot to be said about this. I'll merely make the point that in the modern history of Belarus, Yiddish has always been one of the national languages that have been recognized in Belarus even today. So Kohlbach is, uh, 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 is um, uh, uh, referring to that. Shalom Leaf points out the song also alludes to Avram's seduction of the apron Nasasi. That is absolutely true. That is absolutely implicit in this song, which makes Avram in this uh, uh, reading, in this interpretation, the uh, not just the singer, but also the uh, 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 the song itself, the impulse for the folk song. He's the rapscallion. He's the seducer. He's the violator 
of the of the of the Belarusian uh, uh, princess, who's also at the same time a water nymph, who's also a uh, 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 a mare, who's also a force of nature. She is the physical embodiment of the Belarusian landscape and the physical embodiment of the Belarusian people. And that is who Avram has attached himself to. Is this unnatural? Or is this the most natural expression of a Belarusian Jewish synthesis possible? I want to suggest that Kolbach uh, gives us enough space to leave our own interpretation open as to whether this is uh, an idealization of Jewish-Belarusian symbiosis, or if this is the poem that chronicles, as ballad forms always do, uh, the dissolution of this symbiotic culture. Let me put it this way, ballads, and I've said this before, I'm going to reiterate it because I'm hoping and trusting that this is pertinent to our discussion, ballads commemorate the transformation of history into legend. Byronic ballads is written by Lord Byron, is written by Heine, is written by Peretz, is written by Kulbach signify the dissipation of legend into history. Kulbach here is, is articulating a moment of rupture when both possibilities are uh, uh, simultaneous. The, 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 the welding of contradictory historical perspectives within a single voice is the work of myth. Folk song is an attenuation of myth into everyday historical life. And the modernist lyric uh, 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 refigures the terms of these oppositions. Dream and waking, as Anton reminds us. Let's see whether the final section of the poem and the last section that we'll discuss before holding it, on, uh, holding it open to uh, uh, larger questions uh, signifies the dream or the awakeness. Let's take a look at the Yiddish original, or at least the uh, Soviet redacted Yiddish original. Still pretty close to the original. Section 12. Der Seidenu kommt starben. Gruvia Teub is far nachlich der Seide gekommen von Feld. Zerecke macht still das Geleger und abgesagt wieder. In Herzen zersegnet sich Röker heit mit der Welt. Und dann zugeschlossen an Keuches die Eugen die Miede. Und zu seinen die Vetteres gekommen zu Kappens von Seiden, erabgelost tief die Wagboxene Kapp und geschwiegen. So etwas verchemmet die Herzer und nicht gelost reden. Verchemmet Herzer, as if nit gekant a reis kriegen. Pamela hat damal der Seide geäffet die Eugen, sis waren a schmechele über gegangen sein Pannen. Er hat sich gesetzt auf dem Bett, keim sich über gebeugen, und ot was der Seide hat damal gerät zu die Bannen. Du, Orche, mein Bechor, es gewähnt der Jesod von Mischbacher, der Erster in Feld und der Letzter gesetzt sich zum Tisch. Die Erd hat sich warm zu öffnet von unter dein Socher. Und so wie die Erd soll dein Sommen sein, fruchtbar und frisch. Ach mir, wer kann sich mit dir auf der Lanke vermesten? Gewen is dein Kosse in Groß, wie a 
Plate Salt and Fire. Dich kenne die Schlange und die Sumpen, die Fäglen und sehr, in sehr Nesten. Die Brache so rund bei dir in der Stahl und in Scheier. Du Schmulje, der Teichmensch, nicht auch auf der Welt des Agleichen. Beständig dem Busche auf die Plätzes, beständig an Nasser. Geschmeckt hat mit Schuppen von dir, mit dem Reich von Schleim in die Teichen. Gebencht sollst du sein auf dem Land und gebencht auf dem Wasser. Es ist Nacht zu gefallen. Die Reutinke Scheiblich von Chate in Tunkeln ist haben geworfen ein Schein auf dem Seiden. Es haben gestummt meine Vetters, gestummt hat der Tate und nicht gelost fallen ein Wort von seinen Menschen und Reden. Dann hat sich der Seide zu segen. Die Glieder zusammengenommen und still und auf ewig die Augen, die Starre verschlossen. Geguckt hat der Eulem, geguckt auf dem Körper, dem Stummen und gar nicht gesehen und kein einziger Träger nicht vergossen. Ein Vogel hat ergetz in Wald euch geklockt, vor der Nacht seiner Leiden. Die letzte Lucine in Chate hat kein noch gegliet in die Funken. Und zu seinen die Vetters gestanden zu Koppen von Seiden. Die schwere, bewachsene Cap in die Achsele versunken. I just want to note here, before we go on to the translation, that here the word for darkness is um, tunklinisch a far more ordinary and common word than Heusheknisch, which we saw two chapters ago uh, uh, in the description of the night of the of night in the um, hut in the wintertime. I'll also note two words of uh, ritual significance. He describes the grandfather describes the um, blessing that he gives on his children as a bracha, the actual Hebrew word for blessing. And he describes uh, his own uh, uh, confession is referred to as avida, the actual Hebraic formula for the confessions of uh, a dying person. I'll turn it over now to the English translation. We have one more uh, comment to read. Uh, Hannah remarks that this is Jacob's blessing to his sons. There is a strong element of that in this poem, and I'm going to speak to that uh, at a little greater length in a second. But first, let's read the English language uh, uh, version, because it also reminds us of another patriarch's uh, 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 departure from his, um, from his spiritual children. Let's see what's happening in the English translation now. Grandfather dying. Gray as a dove toward evening, my grandfather came from the pasture. He made up his bed and said a prayer of confession, actually the prayer of confession. Then inwardly bade his farewell to the world and closed his eyes, utterly exhausted. My uncles came in and gathered around at his bedside, bowing their shaggy heads. They stood about silent. Something clutched at their hearts that left them all wordless, clutched at their hearts and kept them from sighing. Then slowly my grandfather opened his eyes and a smile spread over his face. He sat up, though it cost him much trouble. And here's what he said to his sons. You, my Orcha, you've been the family keystone, first in the field and the last one to sit at the table. The earth opened warmly to you and your plowshare. May your seed like the earth be forever as fresh and as fertile. And you, Rachmiel, who is like you in the meadow, your, your sith in the field was an outburst of fire. You are known to the birds in the air, to the snakes in their marshes. May my blessing rest on your barn and blessed be your stable. 
Yushmulia, river man, who in the world is like you, eternally wet and always a lash at your shoulders, smelling of fish scales and smells and scum of the river. Blessed shall you be on the shore and blessed on the water. It was evening, the glimmer of red at the window cast in the darkness a tinge of light on my grandpa. My uncles were still and silent too was my father and caught every word of his blessing. Then grandfather said his goodbyes and gathered his limbs together. He closed his eyes, his wide eyes, one more time now and forever. The watchers looked on and regarded his muted body. There was nothing to see and, and no tear was shed by my uncles. A bird in the forest sang to the night of its sorrows. The last bit of torch in the hut still gleamed in its socket. My uncles formed a small band round my grandfather's pillow. Their heavy, their shaggy heads drooped on their shoulders. So as Hannah points out to us, this reminds us very strongly of Jacob's departure from his sons at the end of the book of Genesis absolutely meant to remind us of that. But before that, the description of the grandfather gathering himself in and uh, preparing himself for his righteous death should remind us of the end of the book of Deuteronomy, where Moses retreats from the children of Israel to the top of Mount Nemo, where, according to the plain meaning of the text and elaborated upon in the rabbinic Midrash, he actually prepares his own grave. He's actually the only person in history to have buried himself. Uh, it's meant to be both of these uh, 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 farewell scenes. And it's also meant to be neither of them. Because even though the grandfather very explicitly, very clearly, very movingly dies the idealized death of a Jewish patriarch, including even here, both the uh, stipulated uh, uh, rabbinic confession in Hebrew and the uh, ideal act of blessing his children. Let's keep in mind, he's not in the promised land. He's not even close. And he's not wishing his children to return to that Zion, but to make their Zion, to make their homeland where they are right now. This is, if you will, a Bundist uh, a, a, a patriarch, uh, a blessing the land and blessing his children in the land, not promised to their ancestors in the Torah, but where they find themselves now. For better or worse, we don't go through 18 blessings. We only go through three of them. To Orche, to Rachmiel, to Shmulia. Nothing said about Itzik the tailor. Nothing said about Avram who's going out with the Gentile girl, with Nastasia. Nothing about the poet's own father. We don't know what their blessings are, what they would be, how they connect to the broader project of the poem. They're not included in our uh, survey. We see Orche as the keystone of the family. We see Rachmiel as the master of the meadows. We see Shmulia as the man of the rivers. We see all the attributes of a Belarusian family, of a tribe of Jewish peasants being united in these three brachas. But we don't know about the 15 other children. We don't know about the diversity of Jewish life that is going to follow the grandfather's blessing. We know only the silence of the uncles in their reception of his blessing the absence of words, the absence of tears. It is in that silence that Kohlbach concludes this poem. Now, according to Simon, 
We have about 15 minutes of more general discussion. There is a lot to think about. There is a lot to meditate upon this poem. I hope that I've conveyed to you some of the power of the poem and some of the potentials for further elaboration on its significance. But for now, let me open it up to chat. Uh, if people would like to be unmuted and uh, speak their comments to the whole group, uh, I think that that would be a very appropriate thing to do. If you'd like to write your um, comments into chat, I'll read them. They'll be on the recording that way. But I welcome your comments, your critiques, your corrections, and your reactions to this really magnificent poem. Thank you all. Thank you, Hannah. Um, Hannah, can you sing the song for us now? Hannah, are you there? Yeah. I, I am. Do you hear me? We I, we do, and it's magnificent. And we are we are waiting. We are waiting your solo. Huh. Uh, hold on. Let me get the uh, text. Do I have to tell. I, I I have to tell you. I don't think that I've sung this in. Um, oh my goodness! Close to seventy years. So uh, let's um, let's see what I remember. On mit Nordel vor dem hängt der Reusser wie Feske, doch verricht man begott ihm, hängt der Reusser wie Feske, doch verricht man begott ihm, and so on. That was great. That was really beautiful. So tell us a little bit, if you can, about, you know, I mean, did you just learn this at home? Did you learn this at, at home? At home. I, I, I have to tell you, you know, I grew up in a Buddhist home and, um, my pet, my mother was from Vilna, and um, both both were very very knowledgeable and and uh, committed to Yiddish culture, and you know about my mother and Kulbach, yeah. uh, and and this must have been this must have been a song that that they sung in the uh, Bundist uh, youth movement, because uh, my father was uh, one of the leaders of the Jugendbund in, in Warsaw, and he taught us most of the songs that I know, as, and it must have been, it must have come from that. Yeah, no, that's magnificent. That's so great to hear. And, you know, I just want to elaborate that, you know, Kohlbach was very involved in youth culture when he returned from Berlin to um, Vilna. Correct. He was a teacher. He mm -hmm. uh, produced Yiddish plays. Among the plays he produced was um, a very early Yiddish farce that was written in the 1790s called Leichsen and Fremelai. It was maybe the first Yiddish language production of this play. Um, and certainly the first production of this play in, oh, over a century. Um, so, uh, 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 and uh, uh, the way that my teacher, David Rostis, uh, 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 described it, Kohlbach was like the Bob Dylan of Vilna, you know, that he was just, he was seen as a kind of spokesperson for the youth in Vilna. Totally, uh, he, yeah. A totally charismatic guy. Uh, if we see photographs of him, I don't mind saying he's rather easy on the eye, especially in comparison with a lot of other Yiddish poets. You know, mm -hmm. very handsome mm -hmm. man, uh, very charismatic, and uh, really speaking to a kind of a bohemian spirit, a kind of free spirit, and a kind of absolute dedication to Yiddish culture. Yiddish culture, I think more uh, significant than um, any particular explicit ideology, whether it would be a Bundes or uh, some other uh, variant. And this was, I think, the conviction that led him to rejoin members of his family in Belarus, this conviction that uh, uh, as long as I'm singing this Yiddish song, as long as I'm writing this uh, Yiddish uh, uh, literature, uh, I'll be okay, whether I'm in Poland, where life is becoming very, very difficult right now in the late 1920s, or in the Soviet Union, where 
hopefully life will be better, where Yiddish literature is recognized, where Yiddish writers are supported, where there's still an audience for the kind of literature I want to be writing. Of course, uh, history didn't work out that way. Uh, but uh, 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 that was um, the, our ability to reconnect with uh, people such as yourself, Hannah, who had uh, a, a nearly direct connection with Kolbat is um, the task of contemporary Yiddish culture to uh, uh, nurture the flame that remains, however flickering, uh, uh, from those continuities to um, a Yiddish culture that spoke to a better world that was available uh, than what was available to the participants of that culture. Uh, they worked to make the world a better place. And we today, in our pandemic, in our uh, political frustrations, in our anxieties about the future, we continue to work to a better world. And I hope that uh, Yiddish poetry can inform the aspirations for the future that we want to uh, create. Now, both Seema and um, um, Simon have uh, pointed out the idea of stitching the world together. Uh, Uncle Itch's uh, 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 Schneiderei, his Taylor Arbit, his Taylor, I, I don't know what language I'm speaking, I apologize. His, his work as a tailor, stitching the villages together, stitching the folk songs together, st stitching the garments together, that there are Hasidic associations to this. There are associations to a notion of repairing the world, not just repairing wearing a garment. Um, those are not uniquely Hasidic. We don't generally associate the Litvish culture that Kohlbach uh, uh, is striving to represent in this poem with Hasidic Jewry, although there were certainly Hasidic Jews in uh, Belarus, in the areas around where um, Kohlbach came of age. But the notion of repairing the world is, we can say, a more generally Kabbalistic notion. Not, uh, it's popularized through Hasidic culture, but it's not exclusive to Hasidic culture. And note, if you will, that Kolbach is simultaneously, um, they are simultaneously uh, uh, stitching these poems together and revealing the seams, revealing the rips that lie just beneath, which is, um, which is uh, 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 what reisen, to tear, signifies. Uh, Sima is pointing out, Zedinu, Bobinu, these are Polish affectionate name endings, not, not uh, uh, Lithuanian ones. Uh, it would be Zedele, uh, Zedeke, Bobinu, Bobike, that would be more uh, uh, Lithuanian. It's, it's, it's a good point. Uh, but of course, uh, for Kolbach and for his readers, both endings, uh, uh, both uh, uh, the Polish influence on Yiddish and the um, uh, Slavic or the Eastern Slavic, the Belarusian uh, 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 or Lithuanian Baltic influences on Yiddish, both would be attainable. He's striving toward a synthesis in uh, 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 his writing. Tamara wants to ask uh, about the lack of Jewish women in the poem in this family of men, aside from the grandmother. They must be there at least in the form of the author's mother. What do we make of this lack of significant presence in the poem? The men together in the hut form a beautiful image, but the omission feels strong to me as well. Tamara, I think that that's a very fundamental uh, uh, reading. It is a fundamental absence in this poem. It is an absence that reflects a similar baffling omission of women in the book of Genesis. Um, we hear about the 12 uh, 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 sons of Jacob. We hear only about one sister. And that's the sister who was violated by the uh, uh, townspeople of, uh, of Shechem uh, in, in last week's Torah portion. 
Well, so uh, how did the rabbis finesse this? Where did the 12 brothers get their wives since there's no reference to them returning to Laban's family uh, 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 back in Haran? And there's certainly no mention of them marrying the forbidden uh, uh, Canaanite women. According to the Midrash, with each of these sons, a daughter was born to um, Rachel or to Leah or to Bilha or to Zilpa. So they were marrying their own sisters. That's the Midrash's uh, uh, explanation, which supposedly is a better explanation than these boys marrying uh, 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 non-Jewish women. Okay, uh, uh, we won't comment on that, but there is a notion in this poem, and I would say that it is uh, a dramatically fraught notion that draws on a larger problem of Jews in the villages. These are village Jews, these are not shtetl Jews. It is in the shtetl that the Jewish family remains a force of continuity. And for many Yiddish writers, it is a source of tremendous claustrophobia. Uh, the problem with the villages is that continuity gets ruptured. So the great uh, 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 lament of village literature, not just in Yiddish or in Hebrew, but particularly in German, is that the children won't find a spouse. They will, um, they will uh, 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 marry a non-Jew. And that seems to be the tension that Kulbach is drawing upon because the only love interest that's actually narrated in this poem is the uh, love story between Avram and Nastasia. So the absence of Jewish women is meant to signify, I think, the absence of Jewish continuity, both of the shtetl to the village and the villagers to their offspring. So uh, Anton asks, is a shtetl eingenam? It's really a reasonable question. Well, I agree. You know, do we, do we like the shtetl or do we dislike the shtetl? Every Yiddish writer and, and also every Hebrew writer of the 19th and 20th century maintains a love-hate relationship with the shtetl. Uh, Kohlbach here is offering a love story for the villages, but it is a love story very significantly that lacks that element that Tamara is, uh, Tamara is pointing out. It lacks the element of uh, a love story between Jewish men and Jewish women. That is what is omitted from Kohlbach's love song to the village. Um, other uh, thoughts, other comments? I certainly want to take this opportunity at this moment to thank everybody for your engagement and your commitment. Four sessions in widely different time zones. It's a lot to ask of people. Um, it's a um, it's a it's a very rare opportunity for me to speak to such a large audience, uh, particularly an international audience, about uh, a subject that is so very very dear to my heart. I thank you all. Hannah talk, talks about the um, idyllicism of this poem in connection with a Yiddish play that was made into a very explicitly Zionist movie, Yiddish Zionist movie called The Greene Felder. Um, which is one of the more famous and really one of the better Yiddish movies that was made in the 1930s. Indeed, idyllicism is a, a, a fundamental point in the uh, 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 Yiddish literature of the 20s and 30s. It's not the only point to be certain, but when it appears in the modernist literature of the 1920s and the 1930s, it is certain as it is here to call attention to its own absence, to the unavailability of the idyllic as a mode of experience. And therefore the idyllic becomes a mode of reverie, of nostalgia, of reverence, of longing, and of aspiration in the better world that we as Yiddishists of the 1920s and 30s hope to create 
somewhere else. Well, we all of us strive to create a better world, whether we see that better world in the villages or in the small towns or in the cities. We all hope to make the better world. And I hope to make a better world with all of you uh, with the legacy of Yiddish poetry in our hearts. I hope that we can do this all again together. I hope that we can uh, uh, organize this soon and that we can all meet together either uh, in person uh, with vaccines instead of masks or uh, online where we can all talk about this literature again uh, uh, very soon. Thank you all.